see me yet? Hello, my name is Daniel Fallsgraf. I am the owner and professional dog connector of B. Deemer Gallery Wheelhouse Art. And it is my absolute pleasure to introduce Madison Kawine and Madison's new exhibition, Empyrean, uh, opening on Friday, September 24th, 2021. And uh, Madison is an artist who I consider to be truly a legacy artist for B. Deemer Gallery. So there wasn't anyone better than I can imagine for us to host our very first full-on exhibition here uh, at B. Deemer this year uh, for the start of my career as gallery owner here. So uh, without further ado, let me introduce Madison Quine. Hi, Madison. Hello, Daniel. It's my pleasure to be with you. Thank you, thank you. So uh, I guess, so this work that you are showing here for your exhibition is, uh, is titled Empyrean. Empyrean is the highest heaven. Um, in, uh, it, and I got the word actually from, uh, um, from Dante's Paradiso. There's a new book out by a guy named Martin Kemp, who's, got, who's a Leonardo scholar and an Oxford professor and uh, an author of multiple books and a, a friend of uh, Matt Gatton, who was, uh, who was, uh, helped me with the photo shoot. And the book happened to be around for the week before the photo shoot. And what it's about is the way divine light was rendered in the Renaissance and, uh, and the Baroque. Um, we're talking about, uh, uh, Raphael's assumption and, and, uh, um, the uh, Eisenheim altarpiece where the artist tried to create light that was not the light that we see, that, that the sunlight that we see that, that shows us objects or even artificial light that we use now, but, but divine light, which they had to imagine. And uh, I can't say that the book was a direct inspiration, but it was around, it was with us. It was, it was part of the atmosphere Mm -hmm. when we started, uh, we started the first of several photo shoots. Uh, I already had the, uh, the chandelier. The chandelier I spotted driving down Cerritos Road, which is sort of uh, the Santa Fe equivalent of New Circle. We were, we were driving around and, and uh, it was hanging in, in, a, in a secondhand furniture shop, of which there are many here, out front. And it was filthy. But uh, it caught my eye and I pulled right over, probably paid too much money for it and spent about a month cleaning it up and taking not even all the wire, but a lot of the wire out of it to convert mm -hmm. it from electricity to candles. And I, I had a real expectation about what I would get and it wasn't this. My expectation came from uh, a wonderful movie that I would recommend to everybody. It's probably hard to find. It was, it was made in India. It was by a director named Satyajit Ray, who got a Lifetime Director Award from the Motion Picture Academy like, uh, like Kurosawa. He's sort of the Indian equivalent in reputation and talent. And this was his very first movie. It was called The Music Room, which is also the title of uh, one of the pieces in the show. And the movie opens uh, with, it's a black and white movie with a shot of a chandelier with candles swaying. And it's uh, a wonderful poetic movie. And that shot is uh, iconic. And so my expectation, not necessarily my goal, was to start there. And we sort of did, but it quickly, uh, the images came so fast and it was so exciting. I didn't really even have time to look at them. Uh, I didn't have time to evaluate what we were doing. It was, it was sort of like uh, uh, Lucille Ball on, on the assembly line with the candy. We were just stuffing images as fast as we could into the camera. And what's wonderful about it to me, uh, there, there are so many dimensions to this for me, but, but what's wonderful to me is, is that uh, these images are all 
something that only the camera sees. And um, maybe not every camera, maybe only a digital camera. I, I don't know enough to say, but uh, everything was in motion in the shoot. The chandelier was in motion. The, uh, the camera was in motion. I was moving around. I was moving the lens around. Um, we were changing the lights. We had reflectors. It, it, there was a lot of motion, um, a lot of chaos in the sense of complexity, not in the sense of just disorder. And so what the camera actually recorded out of all that was, uh, was always going to be mysterious and surprising. So it's not like I looked through there and I thought, oh, well, we'll get some motion blur or we'll do this or we'll do that. Um, the camera doesn't record it in, a, in an orderly way. I don't know how it makes its choices, but you sort of get a feel for when it's working. And so the images will come in streaks um, and that's what happened. And it was just very, very exciting. Mm -hmm. And we had a different show planned. We had a completely different show planned. And, and I loved the images that I made for that. I don't know if you've gotten to see them yet. Uh, I loved them, but these were just on another level for me. And, uh, and so, uh, <laughs> it, it usually I like to be, I like the work to, arrive in a more orderly way. And I try and plan in advance, sometimes a couple of years in advance and march towards, uh, march towards the goal did not happen this time. Mm -hmm. Got a gift, got a tremendous gift. And, and I'm quite thrilled with it. And I'll be assessing what it means for me and my work for, uh, for a while now. It, it will take some time to take this in. Well, when, when inspiration strikes, you got to grab it and hold on as best you can and, and roll with it. I think some people have particularly with your paintings have kind of thought of you along the lines of a uh, realist or photo realist, but, but I kind of, I think it's, it, you go much further beyond a realist or realism in, in the physical world sense. And, and kind of, I think of you a little more as like sort of a spiritual realist where your work is representing what you're seeing, but it's carrying these deeper layers and meanings and experiences of universal truths, so to speak. Uh, you know, I remember years and years ago, um, seeing like a eight foot painting that you had made of uh, the patterns in a sunflower. And yes. Uh, and so when you were talking, speaking earlier about um, the Renaissance painters trying to paint and capture the divine light um, and how that idea may at least, whether consciously or subconsciously, may have influenced you in this body of work. Um, I'm wondering, and this work is so recent. And like you said, it just sort of came at you and hit you and you just had to go with it. I'm wondering, if you've had enough time to digest this work and kind of um, assess how it fits within your greater body of work that you've done up to this point. Well, it's a, it's a different subject and it's a, a different metaphor. Um, I, I, would, uh, I would say the essential, the essential element of any real work of art, anything that really has value um, is a gift. And every artist who works long enough gets, gets a gift at least once. And once you receive a gift, then, uh, um, then that becomes the reason that you work to try and understand that and try and open whatever door inner or outer you can to make it possible for the gift to come through. Uh, the painter George Brock, for example, said, uh, um, the part of the work that you can't understand and explain is the only part that's important. Uh, in the early 19th century, Turner said, uh, I never waste an accident. And that was his British way of, of referring to the gift. People will call it synchronicity or, or any number of other things, an accident, but it's a gift is what it is. 
And that's the, that's the common denominator. People look for uh, uh, a subject matter there, in, especially in, in photorealist painting. You know, there's the guy that paints diners or the guy that paints reflections on buildings or whatever it is. It will be all about the subject matter and that will be the signature. And that's never interested me so much. Um, I think uh, uh, it, it's not the subject matter, it's the content. And the content remains fairly constant. And I, I explore different areas, but to, but to even talk about it that way makes it sound like uh, there's a plan and there's a, a, an idea of how to move forward. And it, it really doesn't work that way. I just try to respond to what moves me visually. And often I don't know why. Uh, when I first started painting sunflowers, I really didn't know anything about those spiral patterns. But as I worked with them, and as I learned from them, I learned about the Fibonacci series of numbers and uh, about the golden mean and that the Fibonacci series, when you get high enough up and you divide two numbers who, that are adjacent together, you get the golden mean, which is an irrational number. That's a a decimal number that goes on forever without repeating. So the su first sunflower you saw was a 34, uh, um, 58 sunflower. So if you count the spiral, the number of seeds in a spiral go in one direction, you get 34, which is a Fibonacci number. In the other direction, 58, divide them together. It's the golden mean, this infinite, non-repeating, irrational number. The fact that that grows in my garden was amazing to me, but what attracted me was looking at that pattern because it's hypnotic. You follow the spiral one way, you follow it another, it goes to the center, it leads you out to the edge. It's unbelievable it, how beautiful and compelling it is. And the logic behind it is that uh, it's the maximum number of seeds that you can fit efficiently on the face of a sunflower. So it has a maximum chance of surviving. And uh, I love that, but my attraction was purely visual. You look at the thing and go, oh wow. And if you don't do that, it's not worth exploring further. And my feeling is that everything in existence, everything in the creation will reveal its creator. And uh, it's not uh, so much a matter of religious faith for me as a matter of delving into a meaning that's not expressible in any other way. So that that image, whatever it is, if it doesn't speak, then, then I don't follow it. But if it does speak, I try to learn what it's saying and I try and delve into it and making it beginning with a photograph, moving on to a painting. Um, that's the whole thing. And it keeps it alive. So it's not that I became uninterested in making more sunflowers, but something else led me forward. And if I'd kept painting sunflowers, which I could have, I have a lot of unpainted images, thousands and thousands. Um, but there's the next one is the one that interests me the most. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think that's one of the things, the beautiful things about your work is how you reveal your vision, being able to see what you see. And so for many years, your paintings have been based off of photographs that you've taken and worked off of to create your paintings. But this exhibition, this is your first time here at Bedeemer of actually exhibiting your photographs. Can you talk a little bit about um, your history using photography in the past and how you feel your relationship is with it now and moving forward? Is, is, is that something that, that you'll be revealing your vision using photography more in the future? I don't know if it will be more or not. Um, what it's done is it's make, made my relationship with photography uh, and the relationship between photography and painting fluid again. 
I, I had been really clear inside myself for some years about uh, a photograph that was going to make a good painting or a photograph that did not need to be painted or perhaps was complete as a work of art in itself. Although I haven't shown photos before now because I wasn't interested to do it. Um, I would say I'm not so clear about that anymore. I don't know if any of these images are paintable or not yet, mm -hmm. or if they're going to take me somewhere else. And I, it, it's, a, a, it's, it's a strange thing that the origin of all this, uh, I am pretty clear about. And I was, at a, a, I was at a spiritual retreat and we were sent outside. It was winter and it was Atlanta and it, it was held in a, 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 what was a summer camp. So there was no heat and it, and it was very cold. It was around Christmas time. And we were set out, sent out in sunset to see where I fell and just watch. So I was sitting by a river and there was a little patch of sky in the river reflected on the surface of the river, a little patch of blue. And the river is flowing under it. So the blue is more or less constant, but the water is flowing under it. So it's being renewed in a certain way as I'm watching. And because it was sunset, the color in the blue started to change. And so I'm watching that. And then uh, upstream, a duck, I heard a duck and flapping and some splashing and the ripples that the duck made upstream passed through my little patch of sky reflected. And I thought, well, this, this, this little patch of sky tells me the time of day by its color. And it also tells me the time of year and I'm starting to get cold and I'm sitting here with this little patch of the creation, this little reflection, and it's telling me where the planet is in its rotation in the day and where it is in its circuit around the sun in the year. It's giving me so much information and there was nothing to it, but it tells me everything. And I thought, how would I ever paint that? How could I ever make that clear to somebody else without a long explanation like this? Mm -hmm. And that's been, that's been a key, that was a key moment for me. How do I do that? What could I see that would show that to somebody else? So going forward, that's where I'm looking. I, I have worked really hard on my years, uh, in my years as a painter on my technique. I spent many years studying Chinese calligraphy, right-handed discipline. I'm a left-handed painter, but my calligraphy teacher, my first calligraphy teacher told me, no left-handed calligraphers use your right hand. And so I practiced that without any expectation of it becoming uh, something that would be a vehicle for me. I don't know Chinese, but I do know how to write it. But it was for me, the study of gesture with a brush. So it was, a, it, was a, it was my painter's hobby to refine my, my sense of gesture. Then for an entire year, uh, I made paintings using the same principle that, uh, that color printing uses, color separations with trans, translucent layers of red, magenta, and uh, magenta red, cyan, and yellow, and black. So I made paintings that way for a year with no white but the white of the canvas. Then I bought uh, an entire um, inventory of paint from one of the local paint stores. They had this beautiful German paint and I, I bought the whole thing from them because they were gonna discontinue it. And they gave me a deal and they let me pay for it over time and they gave me the paint up front. So I had a palette suddenly of 114 colors, not four. And so I spent a year learning what those colors were their history, what they could do, and I didn't mix them. If I wanted a, a, a different color on my painting, I opened a new tube. So the colors are completely unmixed where I'd been layering the year before that. And then I spent a year painting Grisaille, uh, black and white versions like a photograph as an underpainting and glazing on top. And I added these techniques a year at a time in order to master them. And the idea being that eventually they were absorbed and I, um, 
I can stay out of the way better. So I don't think uh, about how to render something or I just look and I watch. For me, making a painting is like, uh, like watching a movie. And then one day you put paint on it and it would be like putting a paint on a real object. If you were in a room and put uh, a, a dab of paint on a flower, it would look different from the flower because it's not part of the same reality. When the reality of the painting pushes me out, I stop painting. Um, so this is a, this is an ongoing thing. And, and I, you try to choose, I always try to choose photographs that are paintable, um, that to have shapes that I can make and colors that, that, that I understand, um, as well as a, an image that speaks. But as I go along, more things become possible. Um, more images, uh, become within my range. And I can see more because you really can't see something um, unless you can kind of believe in it. Seeing something fresh for the first time, it doesn't make sense. When Native Americans first saw ships, uh, European ships landing on their shore, they didn't know what the hell they were. Mm -hmm. Or people on horses for the first time, didn't make sense. It does not compute, don't know what that is. And reality is like that for me. I mean, uh, Anything that you look at, like a chandelier moving, um, it, it's, it's a magical thing. It, it doesn't matter what it is, but just how it appears. And what does it make you feel when it appears in front of you? Can you go into, with your work, some of the things that um, you especially love particular to the media that you're working with, whether it's photography, what you love about photography that you can achieve using that medium versus a painting and vice versa. It, it's, it's also about how it will communicate. Um, uh, and and I've, I've said this before, but for a painting, I need some way for the person to something for the person, for the viewer to recognize so that they will go along with me. Um, and and I, can, I can talk about this in terms of some other painters. There's a, there was a British painter recently died named Frank Auerbach and he made the thickest paintings in the world. The paint on him would be half an inch thick. And he'd paint these faces that, that looked extremely abstract. Um, and he worked from a model. He'd get a model in his studio and he'd, he'd slap the paint on there all day long. And then at the end of the day, he'd scrape it off and he'd start again the next day. And he'd paint them and paint them and paint them. And uh, he had to have the floor of his studio replaced because the paint was three feet deep and the fumes must have been just horrific. Um, but the fact is we, we're all evolved to recognize and read faces. So three dots in a line make a face. Uh, and so he could get very, very abstract with these faces, but you'd still go along with him because it was a face and you'd look at what he was doing with the face and what, what the way he worked with the face uh, showed you or told you. Um, and he, he chose that very consciously because there was that recognizability factor. Take another example, and I don't know the name of this artist, and uh, probably I don't want to know it, but he was a, an artist in the 80s from Germany, and he made a painting of two gray blobs um, that had soft edges. And the title of this painting was Hitler's Ear. So immediately you look at these gray blobs and they're kind of ominous and repellent. And uh, I always wonder why he didn't call it Gandhi's Ear but I think the shock value uh, for him was more important. But without something recognizable, and you really can't depend on a title, um, people won't go with you. They just think you, know, you don't know what you're doing. You painted two blobs, good for you. Um, there needed to be that recognizability. Now, on the other hand, a photograph, it doesn't matter how abstract it is. If it's a photograph, people will try and look at it and figure out what it is. I mean, if it's not too boring, uh, if, it's, if it's not too ugly, they'll, they'll go with you a little bit and sort of say, well, it must be something because it's a photograph because it has that physical connection to the world. 
So the play for me between photography and painting is that you get, you get the, uh, uh, the presumed reality with the photograph that you don't get with the painting. With the painting, you have to provide that. And I've painted abstractly and ultimately it seemed to me kind of arbitrary. You try to make it beautiful, you try to make it meaningful, but a lot gets left out. A lot of things that you feel, a lot of, you know, if you love flowers, how do you, how do you convey that abstractly? Maybe you can do it, flower might be possible. Um, but suppose you love uh, uh, microorganisms or sea creatures or whatever, it, it'll be a little harder to get there uh, if, it's, if it's purely abstract. So it becomes, what do you love? And also, what are you going to communicate with that? Uh, what, what will other people take from it? What do, you what do I take from it? I don't always know what the paintings mean myself. I'm, I'm, I think of myself as more like a midwife. Um, I'm, I'm helping this thing to come into this world. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is they already exist in the invisible world. The invisible world is full of images. And I got this uh, not that long ago, a decade or so ago, I was photographing a peony and it had wonderful mist droplets on it. If it had been raindrops, they'd have been bigger, but the mist drops were like, uh, were like little, little diamonds paving the petals. And I'm about to take the photograph and, and I think to myself, well, you know, if I moved up a step, um, it would be a different photograph. And if I think of my camera as a point on a sphere, then there are an infinite number of points on that sphere. So there are an infinite number of photographs right near where I am on this sphere. If I step back, I have a new infinity, a new infinity of points, another infinity, a bigger infinity, a double infinity. Um, while I'm thinking these deep thoughts, the earth is turning, uh, so the light's a little different. I have another infinity. Well, I thought I'd better take the picture. So I blinked, not seeing what I was photographing, and my finger twitched, not the moment that I chose. So what photograph did I actually get out of that infinite number? I have to think that was the photograph that was intended for me, that I, all the years I lived up to that moment, walking up to the peony, there it was. Did I see it? Did I intend it? Oh, I'd like to think I did, but really I didn't. My eyes were closed, for goodness sakes. And I thought, this is, this is almost an absurd activity in a way, and yet it feels so meaningful. Now I can decide later, well, I didn't like that photograph, or I like this one better. I get to choose. I'm not even going to go into examining those choices. Those choices are just, yeah, this is the one that catches my eye. This is the one that pulls me forward. This is the one I want to live with for a month or a year, or however long the painting takes. Uh, it's, it's an interesting, interesting proce process because I don't know what I'm going to get and I don't feel like I'm in control in it, of it. And all of that talk about trying to master technique, that's so I can stay out of the way better and let the image that wants to come through the door into this world come through. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, that's, that's wonderful, Madison. Thank you so much for sharing with us. And um, your show is amazing, it's beautiful. Being able to, there's a lot to work with here, a lot to explore, a lot of depth within the work for us to engage with each piece. And uh, it's absolutely gorgeous in the gallery. So I'm very happy to, to be able to show your work here. And um, yeah, thank you. You're, you're so welcome. I'm, I'm really glad, too, that you have a couple of paintings. Um, uh, you were, it was your insistence, but, but I'm really glad about it, that you wanted to show a couple of paintings alongside the photographs. And these paintings, um, uh, they, they evolved. They're, they're recent. And so they're very much what I was thinking about. I think they're flowers. Two of them are flowers. One of them is a, is a, is a chandelier, and it's pretty abstract. And I mm -hmm. felt okay putting a painting as abstract as that in the show. I, I was working from a photograph, but, uh, but it's, it's quite abstract, but it's a, it's a chandelier also. 
Um, it's called through glass, through glass, as through glass darkly. We're not seeing it clearly, but but and yet it's a clear enough image. It's a, it's a striking image. The flowers, both of them, were were concerned with light. Um, which, which is what the chandelier is ultimately about. It's a symbol for light, which is a symbol for knowledge, which is a symbol for God, which, you know, which is a symbol for good. It, they, all of these symbols gather. Um, and they, they talked to me. I lived with them for a long time. Um, I painted them during the COVID year. And uh, uh, because there was no pressure, if nobody was going to, galleries much and I wasn't having shows much. I, I really took my time with them. And I think they, they resonate well with, with the photographs. And uh, I hope people will look at them side by side and just let them, um, let them sink in as they will and, and tell them whatever they have to tell. They told me a lot. Excellent. Thank you, Madison. Thank you.